You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. In this and future episodes of this podcast, we'll be exploring all kinds of subjects related to lighthouses. History, preservation, technology, navigation, the arts, and who knows what else. Basically, anything and everything that ties in with the subject of lighthouses in some way. As I said, this is the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. The Society was founded as a nonprofit organization in 1984 and publishes a quarterly journal, The Keeper's Log, and also offers domestic and international tours, which we'll be talking about in future editions of this podcast. You can learn all about the USLHS by going to the website at uslhs.org, that's uslhs.org, and also to the Society's social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Let me say right at the start that I'm very happy to have this opportunity to represent the U.S. Lighthouse Society on this podcast. I want to make it clear that any opinions I state are my own and not necessarily those of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. In my 30 years or so of being involved with lighthouses, it's been a privilege to meet many fascinating people and to make a lot of friends. I'll be talking to many of those people in the interviews you'll be hearing in this podcast, and I'm sure I'll be making a lot of new friends along the way as well. We're going to have a trivia question in today's show with prizes for the first people to get the correct answer. I am not going to tell you where in the show we'll be asking the questions, so you have to listen if you want to win. We are recording the first episode of Lighthearted at the Exeter Inn in beautiful Exeter, New Hampshire, and I want to thank the management of the Exeter Inn. And speaking of friends, my co-host for this first episode is Cindy Johnson. Cindy is the operations manager of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses, which is a chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation, another nonprofit organization that works for lighthouse preservation. So, Cindy, can you tell, uh, tell us a little bit about what got you interested in lighthouses? Sure, and thanks for having me, Jeremy. So, I've lived in different parts of the country, but I've always been by the coast. And for me, New England in particular, I find really full of history and charm, and that includes lighthouses. They're uh, beautiful structures in the most scenic places, and it's been really fascinating to learn about the people involved, the lighthouse keepers and their families. Well, thanks for, again, thanks for being with me today, Cindy. In a few minutes, we're going to listen to an interview with children's book author Sophie Blackall about her book, Hello, Lighthouse. But first, we have a segment about lighthouse history. Yay! Yay. (laughs) Starting now and over uh, the next few editions of this podcast, we're going to explore the history of the world's lighthouses. To get started, let's go back to the very beginning before lighthouses existed. The idea of light or fire cutting through the darkness is a common one in various cultures and religions. Following is an excerpt from an essay by the engineer Sri Priya Sundararajan. She kindly gave her permission for us to read this excerpt. Quote, Since immemorial times, light has offered comfort and assurance, inspiration and guidance, and has shaped how human beings understand the world around them. The cultural myths of several nations center on a period of darkness dispelled by the generation of light in an uncanny parallel to the Big Bang Theory. In the creation myth of Hinduism, primordial darkness gives way to the universe as we know it. In Greek mythology, Prometheus stole fire from the gods out of love for human beings, which allowed man to ward off danger and provide a means to sustain. In the myths of the Inuit First Nations, the Northern Lights represent the souls of loved ones passed on, playing a celestial game of football while offering comfort and connection to those they left behind. Universally, light provides a sense of connection between heaven and earth. Light touches our bodies and empowers our souls." 
In early human history, darkness was a very scary thing. Wild animals and our enemies could kill us more easily in the darkness. We hid in caves and waited for the light. For many thousands of years, the availability of light governed our lives. We eventually learned to light fires to illuminate our caves or campgrounds at night, but as we started venturing out on the seas in boats, the idea of being out in the darkness was very scary. The earliest record of boats carrying goods for trade is around 3500 BC. The first navigators traveled mainly during the day. As mariners ventured out more at night, some learned to plot their course by the movement of the stars and constellations. It's believed that the ancient Phoenicians were excellent celestial navigators and they completed the first circumnavigation of Africa by around 600 BC. But even with skilled navigators, there was always the danger of running into hidden rocks, shoals, and other obstacles. The origins of the lighthouse go back to simple bonfires built on beaches and hillsides in many cultures around the world. The Greeks built braziers filled with fire and put them on hillsides at the entrances to harbors and along navigation routes. The Greeks also built some of the earliest structures that can be called lighthouses as early as the 5th century BC, basically columns surmounted by fires. In our next episode of Lighthearted, we'll talk about the world's first great lighthouse, the Pharaohs of Alexandria. Another subject we'll be exploring in many episodes of Lighthearted is the subject of lighthouses in literature and movies. Lighthouses have long been a popular theme for children's books, and one of the most honored children's books of 2018 is Hello Lighthouse by Sophie Blackall. Sophie Blackall is an Australian artist and illustrator of children's books based in Brooklyn, New York. She has illustrated more than 30 books for children. Her work also includes animated television commercials and editorial illustrations for newspapers and magazines. Her books have won many awards, and her children's book, Hello Lighthouse, which she wrote and illustrated, won the 2019 Caldecott Medal. The Caldecott is presented each year to the artist of the most distinguished American picture book for children. I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Sophie Blackall on the phone. Let's listen to that conversation now. Sophie, thanks so much for speaking with me today. I am delighted. Thanks so much. And congratulations on the Caldecott Medal for Hello Lighthouse. It's a beautiful book. Thank you. Thank you. So this was your uh, second Caldecott Medal. Your first was in 2016 for Finding Winnie, the True Story of the World's Most Famous Bear by Lindsay Maddock. And I understand you're one of nine illustrators to win multiple Caldecotts. That's an incredible achievement. Uh, were you surprised to win a second Caldecott? You don't really expect to win one in a lifetime, <laughs> let alone two. So, yes, I was incredibly surprised. It was all the more surreal because I happened to be in Myanmar at the time. And uh, with the time difference and everything else, it was um, it was an extraordinary phone call to receive. And But I couldn't have been happier. Um, I said to somebody... Uh, when um, when my second child was born, I was every bit as thrilled as when I had my first child. And you don't expect to have this much um, good fortune and joy in a lifetime, but uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't return it for the world. Well, uh, so what was it that inspired you to do a, a book about a lighthouse and a lighthouse keeper? I have... Like most, uh, as, I, as I like to think, like most sensible people on the planet, I have always admired and, and been fascinated by lighthouses. Uh, but it was rifling through old um, prints at a flea market in Brooklyn many years ago, and I saw a cutaway of the Eddystone Lighthouse um, in Great Britain. And for the first time, I was actually looking inside a lighthouse. I had always admired them from from a boat or from the shore or from a headland and but to see this cutaway with the rooms and the spiral staircase and and to to suddenly imagine life within these round rooms this vertical existence um just this 
created some tiny spark of an idea. Um, I was with a friend at the time and I picked the print up and put it down and picked it up and she said, you should get it. And I said, I don't know why I'm getting this. I I don't have any wall space in my house to display it. It's going to go in a drawer. And she said, it's clearly tugging at you and we shouldn't ignore things that tug at us, which uh, I thought was tremendous advice ever since then because I did buy it and I did put it in a drawer for at least a couple of years. But then I opened that drawer one day and there it was and I thought, ah, this is the time I, I suddenly saw how it might be a story. What do you think it is about lighthouses? What what makes them so appealing to people, do you think? I have now asked this question uh, all over the world. I've done uh, uh, a whole lot of school visits, mostly talking to children with this book. And and I'm I'm curious, too, what is it about lighthouses? And I've had as many answers as you can imagine, as as people have all sorts of reasons. Um, and they range from those that I share, that my lighthouses are majestic and romantic and compelling. Um, but one child said to me uh, what I have come to think of as, as one of the best definitions of a lighthouse. And he said, they're like helpful castles in the sea which sums up both the, the, the beauty of the form, the structure itself, and also the, the purpose that they serve, which is, um, which is this steadfast uh, uh, guidance. Um, and of course, these days, it's more of a symbolic uh, thing than, than it is um, a practical, uh, because most lighthouses are, are either automated or or not um, illuminated at all, but they stand as a reminder of this time when we were so dependent upon them and the people who maintained them. Um, but they, they were they were light shining out in in the deep dark sea, and for sailors on long journeys, um, I I believe they were they were a sense of not being alone in the world. They were a sense that someone or something was watching over them, and I think they've. They provide that for all of us. Helpful castles in the sea. I love that. Uh, so how have children responded to the book, to Hello Lighthouse? It, it's been phenomenal. Um, I confess this was a book that I wanted to make so much for myself that I worried at some point that I had lost sight of, of children's interest in it. And I'm some people... Like Maurice Sendak famously said, I make books and then other people tell me they're for children. He did not set out to make books for children, but I have always set out to make books for children. Um, They're incredibly important to me that the the way they respond to my books is very important. But I feared with Hello Lighthouse that it became such a personal book that, that perhaps they wouldn't respond to it in the way that I had hoped. Perhaps it was too grown up. It's about adults more than it is about children it's a I think it's quite a romantic story but it's about life and loss and change and renewal and hope and these are all quite grown up things in a way until I remembered that they're also things that children experience they're things that we all experience and so the the Reality is it's been overwhelming how children have responded. And I've gone into schools and a teacher has told me that they have run a competition within the school uh, to uh, to have lunch with the author um, before my visit. And usually they will get a handful of entries and everybody who enters will get to have to get to have lunch. But in this one particular school, almost every child in the elementary school entered and it was they had to either draw or write a poem or a story, something on a theme of of a lighthouse. And the pictures and poems and stories that flooded in, there were hundreds of them. And I I read almost all of them and they, they were just they were joyous um and it really brought it home that that everyone loves lighthouses but especially children they they're as drawn to them as i am um for their own reasons and and for for, for the same ones that i am well that's great to hear the children have, have responded so so well to it but I, i'm sure i'm not the only adult who loves it so much and 
you know, I have a pretty big uh, collection of Lighthouse Children's books myself, and uh, I have to say, I love the uh, all the details you included, all the very uh, you know very nicely developed details in the book. Things like the uh, the fog bell, the trimming, the keeper uh, trimming the wick in the lamp, mm -hmm. uh, the details of the spiral stairs in the lighthouse, the very detailed drawing of the Fresnel lens in the lighthouse. The uh, you had you went into the automation of the light uh, towards the uh, the end of the book. Uh, your research into lighthouses really shows uh, quite a bit. And uh, you mentioned you were inspired by a cross-section of the Eddystone Lighthouse. I was wondering, uh, the, the lighthouse in the book is a little bit reminiscent of Eddystone Lighthouse, but were you influenced by any other particular lighthouse? Did you, did you base the lighthouse in the book on a particular lighthouse? Um, I Well, first of all, thank you so much for saying that because I, I, I confess um, speaking to someone like you who is steeped in decades of, of lighthouse law and literature and information. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that, uh, that, that you think those, those details are, uh, are all there. Um, I did do an awful lot of research, but at the same time felt that I was just scratching the surface. Um, that there are, as you know, lots of wonderful museums and archives and and the the website um of the US L H S. Have I got that right? Yes, yeah. you did. Yeah, yeah. US I Lighthouse guess. Society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> always those acronyms always throw me. Um it was, you know, incredibly helpful and is just a a, a a wonderful kind of rabbit hole. Um you can you can <laughs> go in there and just go from from one link to another and uh, and and so that was hugely helpful. Um, but even with that, there were things that uh, I was towards the end of the book when I realized um, that that during the daytime that the lens needed to be protected from the sun. That there were that that otherwise there was the, the risk of fires, and so there would be uh, curtains drawn mm -hmm. um, on the inside of the the lantern room. And so I had to go back early on. There's a as a page where we see the lighthouse um, on the on the windy page, and I had to quickly draw in the lighthouse keeper pulling the curtains across um, inside. So it was very much an ongoing thing until the very last minute. This research and uncovering new information about how the whole lighthouse worked. Um, but kids love that part of it. They love hearing about winding the clockwork and and how often that had to be done and the thought of never having an uninterrupted night's sleep um they love the bell and the stories of of the bell and and the fog horns in different kinds of lighthouses and the tenders um how long you would have to wait between their visits but also how uh keepers would would get from the ship to the lighthouse shore in these treacherous waters with you know, craggy rocks when the boat couldn't come close enough and they'd have to use a bosun chair or um, the the pulleys and things that would, you know, that's just made for children in a way. It's all so exciting and, and intriguing and, and fantastic. I'm curious, uh, could you say a little bit about the media you use to uh, illustrate Hello Lighthouse? The illustrations I, I find very precise and delicate. And I, I read somewhere you used uh, Chinese ink and, and watercolors. Is the is the Chinese ink thing, is that something that's unusual at all? I think it is a little bit unusual. It's it's the way I've been working for, for about 15 years, and I discovered it by accident, but I'm sure I'm in no way um, the only person to use it in this way. Um, I don't use it in the traditional sense that Chinese calligraphers use it, um, which is to grind the ink on a stone and and then to use a, a, a sumi brush or a Chinese calligraphy brush um, to paint the, the ink in a, in a deep, rich black line. Instead, I grind the ink on the stone in the same way, but then I use it uh, in more sort of transparent um, layers to build up the dark tone. And then I use uh, washes of watercolor over the top. So it has the effect a little bit of, of like tinting an old black and white photograph. Um, and and this is this is just the way I've developed uh, my own um, technique and and 
uh, it, it it feels like a little bit of magic when the color goes on. It's it's always a, it's always the fun part to watch these black and white pictures sort of come alive, as it were. Well, it is magic. They're very beautiful. Would you say that has the uh, process of uh, researching and writing and and illustrating uh, Hello Lighthouse has it made it has it made you into more of a lighthouse buff than you were before you started the whole thing? Oh, it's completely seductive. Um, I realized you actually asked me before if there was a particular lighthouse that it was uh, that the book was was based on, um, and it wasn't one particular one. Um, I did uh, I did cheat a little bit, and certainly the interior uh, has echoes of of Eddie Stone or or those uh, stone uh, rock lighthouses right. built, built on a rock or a ledge. Um, but the exterior is closer to uh, a few that I visited in Canada, in Newfoundland. Um, uh, it's a little bit like Peggy's Cove Lighthouse, which is a fairly famous one, I think, in Nova Scotia, yes. which I did not visit. Uh, but it also uh, is similar to one I, I did um, stay in, in uh, on Quirpon Island, um, on the northernmost tip of Newfoundland. Uh, so that had a wooden exterior. The island it was on was was much bigger than than the imaginary rock um, where I placed it. And also, I think these uh, these solitary remote rock lighthouses would more likely have had two or three keepers rather than a a couple, a married couple living there. But for the purposes of my story, I wanted to to make that the the, the the inhabitants to make them the inhabitants so no, I didn't mind that at all I I didn't I, I realized that you sort of uh, cheated a little bit in that way but I didn't mind <laughs> that at all and you know uh, in American lighthouses early on uh, in the the uh, 19th century the uh, they did uh, populate some of those lighthouses with families before they decided it would be a better idea to make them so-called stag stations with males only. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you, you probably did read that historically there were families in some of those uh, very remote lighthouses. And I think that was true in Europe as well. So, um, Yes. Yeah. I mean, some you read about had 11 children born in right. a lighthouse. Right. And the, the one, in fact, on, on Quirpon Island had had uh, nine children. Mm -hmm. And at, at its base, there's a tiny white picket fence uh surrounded grave i mean it's it's as big as a shoebox and that's where two of the infants who perished in childbirth were buried at the at the base of this lighthouse and um and that struck a chord immediately and and just reminded me as i began to read about about so many different lighthouses that uh that that all of them were filled with stories and stories of of life and stories of loss and of and of death um and that these stories were all recorded in the logbook uh not as stories as such but as as just you know succinct brief notations alongside reports of weather or passing ships or oil usage um and you'd stumbled across you would stumble across a you know something sort of profoundly human and and heartbreaking in its kind of brevity uh well sophie blackhall thanks so much for spending time with uh with us today and uh congratulations again on the success of hello lighthouse thank you so much it's it's always a joy to talk lighthouses with anybody thanks so much for your time <laughs> Okay, it's time now for our trivia question. Drum roll, please. I want to do a drum roll. How can I do a drum roll? <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. The first two people to answer this question correctly will win prizes. The first gets a 2019 U.S. Lighthouse Society calendar featuring photographs by 14 talented society members. The second gets a Lighthouse Illumination DVD. This video takes you on an animated tour through the history of lighthouse illumination. The Fresnel lens is explained in detail, showing the formulas used in the early 1800s, along with animated descriptions on the workings of the Fresnel lens. It also includes a lighthearted look at the history of lighthouse illumination that's a great educational video for children. 
Okay, Cindy, please tell us this week's trivia question. Okay, here's the question. Who was the first woman lighthouse keeper in North America, and where was she the keeper? Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. One more time. Who was the first woman lighthouse keeper in North America, and where was she the keeper? And how do people enter to win? They should send their answer in an email to jeremy at uslhs.org. Right. Send your answer in an email to me at jeremy, that's J-E-R-E-M-Y, at U-S-L-H-S dot O-R-G. Again, that's J-E-R-E-M-Y at U-S-L-H-S dot O-R-G, jeremy at U-S-L-H-S dot org. Please state that you are answering the trivia question in Lighthearted Show 1. Again, the trivia question in Lighthearted Show 1 and include your full name and mailing address. Again, the first two people who answer correctly will win a prize. I was thinking about something just before our recording session today, and I want to get serious for just a moment. Not that they were doing a comedy show here, but I'm going to get a little more serious here for a moment. Uh, The past year has been kind of a sad one for the lighthouse preservation community. We've lost several people who were very important to us, some of them far too young, including Candace Clifford, Terry Pepper, and Eric Davis. I know that some of you listening knew these people quite well. Uh, There were leaders in every sense of the word, through their research and writing, and simply by being steady role models. They were some of our guiding lights. This points out the fact that the lighthouse preservation world, like the world in general, is populated by human beings who are not around forever. We're always struggling to bring new, younger blood into the field, and by young blood I mean under the age of 60. No matter what age you are, if you're listening and you have an interest in lighthouses, I strongly encourage you to get involved in some way. It doesn't mean you have to devote your life to lighthouses, although that can be rewarding if you choose to do so. If you live near a lighthouse, maybe you can volunteer once in a while to help out at open houses, or to help in a lighthouse museum or a gift shop, or to help uh, your local lighthouse organization in some way. If you're not sure how you can help, contact the U.S. Lighthouse Society or another lighthouse organization and ask what you can do to help. And if you're a younger person who has ideas about how lighthouses can be better promoted, In this age of digital technology and social media, please let us know your ideas. You can email me at jeremy at uslhs.org. Again, jeremy at uslhs.org. The music you heard at the opening of this podcast and are hearing again now is called Pharaohs by someone who calls him or herself or themselves (laughs) O-W-S-O. When I found this piece of music, I thought it was perfect. And when I saw the name of the piece was Pharaohs, which means lighthouse in several languages, I thought it was a bit of serendipity, and I knew I had to use it. The guitar interludes you heard between segments are played by my good friend Joe Rivers, who is a musician, audio producer, and engineer par excellence. I think that's how you pronounce that. (laughs) Okay, thank you. (laughs) Uh, I've known Joe since my days as an Omnimax projectionist at the Boston Museum of Science. I won't say how many years ago that was. Uh, And Joe is always more than willing to lend a hand at whatever project I'm doing. So thank you very much, Joe. Thank you to Jeff Gales, Executive Director of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, for his friendship and support in helping to get this podcast off the ground. Thanks also to Maria Guevara, Social Media Consultant of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, for her help and support. And I want to single out Tom Wheeler, website guru of the USLHS, also for his invaluable help. Thanks also to all the other staff and volunteers of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. And of course, a big thank you to Cindy Johnson for helping me out today uh, as my co-host. I hope this was fun. Cindy? This was a lot of fun, informative, and I'm looking forward to episode two. So thank you so much for having me, Jeremy. Well, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. And, of course, many thanks to our guest, Sophie Blackall. And until next time, keep a good light.